Hey guys, so today I am going to talk about uh, Watts, Eric, Nico, Roman Sharf, Wolves of Watt Street, how other people in the gray market are going to be affected long term by the timepiece gentleman's actions. Now, the gray market is called gray for a reason, right? Um, in SEO, what I do for a living, there is white hat, black hat, and gray hat. Uh, white hat is you obeyed all what Google wants you to do and you did exactly what Google wants you to do. Black hat would be you did what you probably realized Google does not want you to do, but you gained the system. So now you rank above people doing white hat because you have found kind of a abuse, something that you can abuse in the algorithm. And then gray hat is somewhere in between where you do maybe a little bit of black hat, but not all the time. And for the most part, you stay in good terms with Google. So gray market is kind of a shadier market, right? I mean, when you talk about shades, shades are gray. It's a lot of trust and it's very competitive. Uh, it is an incredibly competitive market. And the reason that it is competitive should be obvious. Uh, whether Roman probably has the same watts as Watts Eric. Watts Eric probably has the same watts as the Timepiece Gentleman. And they probably have these, especially when you're talking about Rolexes, Daytona, Date Just. These are very, I don't want to say common because they're not common, but these are really easy watches to gain access to sell. And many times they're actually just using the same watt. I mean, it, Roman could be trying to sell the same watts as Watts Eric and they're just listed as Nico and they're just listing the same watch over and over again on different websites. I know Chrono does that very often where the price is listed to include a margin. So if somebody, if I list it for $20,000 and you actually buy it, I can get it for 18,000, but I don't have it actually in my inventory. It's someone else's watch. And this is very common in the gray market. Now, another guy I watched, he's from the UK, he's not Paul, I forgot what his name was, David something, and he was talking about the consignments being bad and that he would never do consignments. I kind of agree with that video. By doing a consignment, what you're suggesting is you don't have the money to outright buy it. Now, I know in the timepiece gentlemen, consignments are kind of viewed as, oh, you can get more money if you wait a little longer, and then we don't have to put in the capital, but Part of that weight to potentially get more money, and sometimes that doesn't happen, depends on the buyer, right? Uh, and depends on the watch, is the risk associated with something going wrong with the watch. So maybe the watch gets damaged, maybe somebody takes a watch to the gym and works out and it gets scratched and now it needs to get polished and it's gonna take even longer. Uh, maybe somebody, the watch, the people that you can sign with, they took off for two weeks. And their website was down, so the normal traffic to see the watch, the consigned watch, is no longer there because the social media, which is really important in this scenario because it's the one driving sales to your watch, is uh, not operational. So I want to make it very clear. They can be friendly, but they shouldn't be buddy-buddy, right? Like Roman Scharf and timepiece gentlemen they're actually competitors if you look at their inventory there there are ways competitors can work together just like when anthony was talking about how he met marco how he could sell the watch for more money but marco could get the money watch for less money that's one way competitors can work together but for the most part they're still competitors um, if a customer is in the market for a watch and they buy the watch from Roman, they're not buying the watch from the timepiece gentleman. And the timepiece gentleman, unless there's some consignment issues, are not, you know, they're not benefiting from that transaction. So what they did was they did so many collabs and they did something very interesting. They, I remember one video, they were talking, Anthony was talking about, hey, you know, I want to get, all my competitors and I want to take them out to lunch or take them out to dinner. And that's a really unique way to look at it. I'm in a hyper competitive field marketing and toys. I also own a toy store that's hyper competitive and it's a zero sum game. 
if somebody use if some dentist chooses to use marketing A, agency A, that by default they're choosing not to use any other marketing agency B, including my own. So therefore, it is a it's a jungle out there, and I expect that the gray market, because I understand Pokemon cards and Magic cards very well in the gray markets, if you will, it's brutal. And the fact that they could all get on, you know, on a live chat and be good friends, and they really did seem like they were good friends, and they had a business relationship with each other, and they had they were connected, even outside of business, right? Especially Roman, I would say, to Anthony in particular. Um, but that. And its natural aspect shouldn't, like, you know, work. I mean, even Wolves of Wall Street, they're basically new, right? A few weeks ago, they appeared on the Timepiece Gentlemen. They appeared finally with their faces as they decided, hey, you know what? We are going to do this full time. We're looking for a website. We're looking for a office space. Um, they're doing exactly the same video Anthony has done. And Anthony is the one who encouraged them to do it. So that is very very that's strange to me because in my field we eat each other for lunch and breakfast we don't have that type of relationship i mean i know other agency owners and i white label for some of them so there is a beneficial relationship you know many times between me and another agency owner because i will white label for them so they give me money and i do their work but for the most part we are just fighting tooth and nail to get the clients and the more clients i have the less clients they so the fact that they were going to grow the whole space and that's what is very compelling here they grew the entire space with everyone in it including archie so without the timepiece gentleman i'm not even sure what archie would talk about like bergen bags i don't i don't know he's a very interesting character but definitely he wouldn't may have the views or money the same with lux lux cannot exist without the timepiece gentleman he's nothing without them so interestingly enough the timepiece gentleman not only grew its competitors to you know roman channel almost doubled in size and now they started doing gray market which is you know much better than watson's whiskey in my opinion it's much more engaging and interactive and their numbers will show that their numbers clearly show that more people are interested in their great market series than their watches and whiskey it's fascinating they also grew a very subgroup of people on reddit which are their haters without them they wouldn't have hate i mean like just if so if the timepiece gentleman never existed then so many of these hater channels and hater obviously the whole reddit subreddit wouldn't even have anything to talk about. So what would they do? They would just troll and hate on other people. So that's fascinating. They, they've they attracted their competitors and they've been open with it. Instead of like, you know, hey, Roman copied us and they've never mentioned that. But Roman did copy them, as did Watts Eric, as did, you know, any vlog channel like uh, Wolves of Watts Street. And I mean, everyone has a vlog channel now. It's like, it's very common for a Watts... Avi and Co. started vlogging recently, and they've been in the watch business for a long time, and only recently have they started to vlog their you know travels to the one home. Uh, and there was another dude that they met. So everyone who has met Anthony has started a watch blog, including the timepiece pieces or something, the timepiece piece. Um, they're a very interesting channel. They're the dude with like the whole case of Richard Mills. And, you know, they only have an office and they're talking about marketing and, you know, building websites and, you know, and their story. I think one of them uh, went to Drexel University and then his uh, roommate was also, you know, part of the business or his, his college buddy was also part of the business and they kind of grew it from there. His family owns a jewelry store. Um, the, the Asian dude is probably going to start a vlog soon. I mean, they all looked at Anthony, looked at Darby and said, you know what, this is a good idea. And I look at it in my marketplace and I say, wow, this is a pretty good idea. So not only did they not, you know, not only were they, they were openly trying to build up YouTube channels much smaller than theirs, right? Like watches of Wolf Street, I would say they're probably their first 5,000 subscribers came from Timepiece Gentlemen, came from their shout out there. 
Uh, the same, I would say, with Roman. I don't think Roman gets to 70K without the timepiece gentleman. And I, I think it's just data and statistics. And I can show you on Social Blade what his growth used to look like and what his growth looks like today. So, I mean, every time that the timepiece uh, Anthony shouts out the Reddit, the timepiece gentleman Reddit, it grows another 200 members, right? So... They are really good at growing social media and getting attention. And even if you love them, hate them, or indifferent, they will get you to watch their videos, which is quite incredible to do. So I, I mean, originally I had thought he was a very good marketer. And then, you know, then the PR stunt kind of went awry. So I didn't, did I expect the PR stunt to go that poorly? No. I thought at the least producer Michael would give him a shout out. I mean, I mean, they were going to get a whole interview, like the Niles interview, on producer Michael's 1.2 million subscriber channel. Many of them who don't know who Timepiece are. So I mean, they're they're the perfect audience, perfect demographic, people interested in luxury items, including oh, well, guess what, Rolexes. It, it was fascinating, you know. I I look at this and I I have to smile a little bit and say that Anthony made a mistake that I could have made. I could see myself making the same mistake, maybe done differently, but something similar. And now I'm learning from it. And that's the beauty of his vlog is he talks a lot about business. Uh, he talks about motivation, setting high goals, high expectations. If you don't reach them, that's okay because you probably landed somewhere higher than your normal goal was. He talks about business and selling and consignment. I mean, this stuff is interesting to me because he has a different perspective on it. Um, my, I mean, I have always viewed my competition as a zero-sum game. And you watch this channel, you know this. If I got in a room with them, we would fight. We would physically probably fight. Because there are clients they took from me and there are clients I took from them. And it does affect our livelihood, especially since we're smaller marketing agencies. Anthony said, hey, you know, I want to take you out to lunch, Roman. I want to take you out to lunch, watch Eric. Nico, you know, I want to phone you all the time. And that's very fascinating. And that's a perspective. And also the vlog thing was huge. So I didn't expect their PR stunt to fail as epically as it did. Now, I know why it failed. It obviously it makes sense in hindsight. But at the time, I thought they were going to bring out something like crazy. Like, oh, producer Michael is going to buy a bunch of watches from us. That's what I thought was going to happen. It, it didn't happen, obviously.